a lot of time to work together this morning. I'd like to make the most of our time. I think it would be really terrible if I didn't start by giving a great big thank you to all of the people who made it possible for us to be here today. Obviously, Cliff, who's been real involved in the organization of this, but all the people who have kept the uh, dream of uh, Parkman alive and who continue to provide us with information and research in his story. I can't imagine what my life would be without them, so I, I really want to thank them. I was first introduced to axiology in 2004, and um, it's been probably the single most important learning of my lifetime. It's influenced everything else that I do. Okay, so this is a book that I co-authored with a woman named Stacy Ennis that was built on a platform or an architecture of axiology. We didn't talk about axiology in it, but if you understand axiology and you read it, you'll see that we're using it over and over and over again. And I'll sign it for you later, yes. sis. <laughs> okay, so um, we understand the way that Bob Hartman defined axiology as an organizing system of logic that mimics what mathematics does to the natural sciences so that we can climb that hill that Cliff was talking to us about earlier and really so that we can create a, create a beautiful future for formal axiology. I so appreciated your <coughs> brief comments, Art, because you said something that was very insightful, I thought. You said that when we look at over the last 43 conferences of the Hartman Institute, <coughs> that in some ways applied axiology has moved forward, has advanced more than formal axiology, and we need to bring balance to that. I think that's really at the core of what I'd like to talk about today and what I'd like for us all to work on today. So I, I'm not a formal axiologist, I'm a practitioner. But because axiology has such a profound impact on my thinking, there isn't anything I do that I don't run it through that filter. It doesn't matter where I speak, what the topic is. I'm always asking myself, what's the systemic dimension here? What's the extrinsic part of this? What's the intrinsic part of it? And it's become one of the greatest compasses that I've been able to use throughout my career. So I'm thinking, how do we take that further? How do we really create a beautiful future for formal axiology? And Bob Hartman gave us the clue because he said, we're trying to mimic what mathematics did for the natural sciences. So for me, I approach it not as an academic, but as a layperson, as somebody on the street, what's the first rule that you learn in mathematics? Addition. Yeah, for me, I've actually, that wasn't the first. Counting. Counting. Counting, yes. I have nine grandchildren. Two of them turned 17 today. I'm just praying that they stay out of trouble. Um, <laughs> but the younger ones, we have a lot of fun because they start counting one, two, three, seven, nine, ten. And we have one of our granddaughters is three years old, and we regularly hear her trying to practice learning this rule of counting. And she doesn't do it all that well yet. But that's okay, that's a part of the process that she goes through. She has to repeat that over and over and over again until it becomes a part of her mind that it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then, of course, we don't stop there. It's another huge milestone when we can get to 20. And then we can get to 30. And what happens when we get to 100 and 1,000? And then somebody told me, I asked a mathematician once, how many possible combinations can you get from the HVP, the two lists of 18 items? And he told me, and I said, would you write it to me in an email? Because I'll never remember it. And I'm going to round it off for you today, because I don't remember the exact number. But he said that there are 39 sextillion possible combinations of the two lists of 18 items. Now that's counting. 39 sextillion possible combinations. Isn't that mind-boggling? So we started with counting, and then I heard somebody say what the next rule was that we learned. And that was we went to school and we started to learn addition. Remember how you learned addition? My fingers. First on your fingers? You might have had an abacus. Some of us, some of us that are a little bit older, they actually used abacus back then. You still started with your fingers? I said, I think everybody started with their fingers. Well, I'm not, because I'm losing my mind, I don't remember that far back, please. <laughs> <laughs> but then I remember, I do remember taking home worksheets. Matter of fact, I don't remember taking home one worksheet. It was worksheet after worksheet after worksheet. And there were usually 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 problems on that worksheet that we had to solve. So it was not easy for us to learn that rule. It took a lot of practice. 
And then for me, it was in the, I think it was end of first grade, beginning of second grade, I learned the next rule of math, which was subtraction. This actually was one of the most intellectually disruptive times in my life. Because all the rules that I learned in addition didn't work. I had to learn a whole new set of rules. And at first, I distinctly remember trying to correct my teacher. No, 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 you've got it wrong. Because I was relating to the rules of addition, and she's trying to teach me on a whole new set of rules. What happened after that? Yeah, for a lot of us, it was multiplication. Do you remember what the key was to that? Tables. Oh, <laughs> memorizing your multiplication tables. The back of your copy book. Pardon? It was the back of your copy book you checked. Oh, was it? I never, I hadn't learned how to cheat yet, KT. So I actually had to do it the hard way. I had to memorize. And again, now because I have grandchildren, they bring back some of these old memories. By the way, I've learned through neuroscience that the older you get, the better you remember those early years. But you can't remember where the keys are. So multiplication was a lot of memorization. It was three times three, four times four. It was all of these tables that you had to learn. What came next? Division. Division, yep. And somewhere in there we got into long division. It's a whole new set of rules. You had to learn a whole new set of skills. Wow. And after division, what came after that? Fractions. Fractions. Wow, you are so, you're, you're really remembering well today. That's great. And I don't know, if, I think at some time after that, I got into my first class of algebra. And then after that, it was geometry. And then I remember Algebra 2. Yeah. What came after Algebra 2? Oh, trig. Yeah, I didn't get some trig. Right. And then pre-calc. Isn't that something? The rules are so complicated that we had to take a pre-class before we could take the real class. Mm -hmm. And then we had calculus. And I'm going to stop there. But I know that if we go far enough in Hartman studies, eventually we get into this transfinite math with all these weird symbols and everything. He was telling us that we need to build a logic structure that parallels what mathematics did for the natural sciences. So the question when we think about creating a beautiful future for formal axiology is how far are we in building that science? Now, I know not everybody likes to think of it as a science. Some of us like it to stay in the world of philosophy, and that's okay. I think actually I probably use it more as a philosophy than a science because I'm a practitioner. I'm not an academic. But when I hear us talking about creating a beautiful future for formal axiology, the question I have is, how many rules have we created for axiology at a formal level? I'm going to start by saying that I think what Bob Hartman laid the foundation on was the definition of what is good. He said good is concept fulfillment. Excuse me. To summarize it. Go ahead. And I'm going to suggest that we could probably also all agree that maybe the second rule, maybe not, maybe we still have to think more academically about this, but the second rule was that there were three dimensions of value. And as Cliff shared with us this morning, it was that I is greater than E is greater than S. Do you know just that in and of itself is a rule that takes time to learn? Because even when you talk with people who are very smart, they don't want, they don't agree with that right away. They're like, I'm, they're like I was when I was trying to correct my second grade teacher about subtraction. They're saying, no, 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 that doesn't work. There are lots of ideas that are more valuable than people. There are a lot of people who believe that way today. So we still have to convince the world that this is a rule that works. For me, the third one is three ways of defining value. I've got to need something that works way better here. So I'm, I'm trying, one of my career goals is to be able to teach axiology to eighth graders. Because I don't think we'll change the world until eighth graders can understand it. So I know in a lot of Hartman's works, he said three definitions, and he looked at the system. But I don't think that resonates with eighth graders. So what I'm playing with is three ways of defining each of these dimensions. So we can define the systemic dimension systemically, extrinsically, or intrinsically. We can define each of them using those three things, and we begin to see the fractal nature of axiology. I think another, the next thing is valuation. So now we start to talk about balance or bias. And the way I like to describe that is what we're really talking about is understanding our relationship 
to those three dimensions. Because valuation, balance, or bias is how do I feel about that? And am I overvaluing it? Am I undervaluing it? So I think that that's the fourth rule, but oh my goodness, I'm stuck at that point. I don't know where to go after that. And you might not even agree with the first four. And look at what we have to match. If we're really going to create a beautiful future, we've got a long ways to go. So what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to break up into your five groups. And I'd like for you to talk about how do we build the science? What are the rules that need to be created going forward? I love, Cliff, I love the book, The Five Lectures. It's great. The fifth lecture left me a bit frustrated because Bob Hartman in the fifth lecture was writing about or speaking about his vision of using axiology as a science. But no application. I mean, the applications were very weak, very superficial. And I love looking back like we did today, but if we only look back, we will never create a beautiful future. So I'd like you to go, we've got flip chart paper, we've got actually seven pieces up, but there are only five of you because of the size of the group. So why don't we go, this is group one, this is group two, let's do group three back here, group four over here, and group five over here. And I'd, I'd like to give you 15 minutes to talk about what are the rules of the future. How are we going to advance the science of formal axiology in the future? And then we'll come back together and let each group report out on what your conversation produced. And we'll think about how we can leave here with an idea of creating something new, not just appreciating something that's already been created by us. So go ahead, go your groups. You've got 15 minutes. I'll give you the five minute warning. Tell us about your conversation and why you put on the flip chart what you put on the flip chart. So let's begin with group number two. <laughs> Who's your spokesperson? I'll be it. I All right. You can leave it there. Okay. That's okay. But you can come up here and okay. talk us through it. I'll do my best. I feel like I'm the newest exposed to Hartman in my group. So you, well, that's wonderful. We'll see how much I can you may have the most, the most here. significant insights. Your name Maybe. is? Maybe. My name is Catherine. Catherine, with a C or K? With a C, like Catherine the Great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm from Brooks yeah. in Utah, so right here I'm actually one of Cliff's uh, former students and current student and a hopefully now a student apartment as well. Fantastic, wonderful. So talk to us through about what happened with your group. Well, we dived first into the question of mathematics as it relates to, um, as it relates to axiology and moved into the concept of axiology versus axiometry. Was that word? The axioms. Axioms, yeah. yeah, and what axioms we agree on. And that actually ended up being one of our rules as to what axioms do we agree on to form this foundation for axiology and for application and um, practice and theory and furthering the work. And then we also agreed to keep it simple and then keep it current and relevant. There was a lot of talk about youth and how we engage with students and how we engage the content that is more than three syllables 
to people who might be intimidated by that or have never been exposed to that before. So we only got our three rules. But. Yeah, great, good. That's a good discussion. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. Are still working, so I don't know. I told them they had to quit. But keep going, I'm just going to keep going. going. Let's, Let's go to group three. Who's the, who's the spokesperson? Come on up. Very nice printing, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> and is it Merit? Yes. Yeah. And where are you from, Merit? From Germany. I can offer German, Spanish, or English. So why don't you try English today, just so the cars I guess it would be the most appropriate. Great. I noticed that Rachel cuts in line. You decided you're going to be for group two. Then made me as a spokesperson. Okay. We came up with different just examples from how do we present sexuality to our clients or audience. And just a few of our thoughts. Was the concept needs to be simplified? Just don't use the word axiology. Never, <laughs> never do that. Uh, but it should not be simplified as a concept, but in its expression. So, to, how do you explain it to people? And you, James came up with the um, idea to, to we need to give people a hook um, to be able to to create this relatability. And just do it um, in a creative way. Just use examples that you think your clients could understand to meet them where they are, I would say. Um, yeah, and, and we, uh, it was Susan? Susan. Uh, so we, we absolutely need the theory and we need to understand the theory behind to be able uh, to bridge that into the future. Yeah. That was the most. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Maybe a recurring theme, but what I've heard from the first two groups is that we haven't really got good first rules yet. No. We still have to get those clear before we can build on top of it. What about group number four? You finished. Do you want to come up front and tell us what you've been working so hard on? All right, go girl. Uh, this is called Overachievement. Yes. <laughs> and your name is Cleo. Cleo, where are you from? Really? I'm from Boise, Idaho. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Where do you live? I don't know. I live here now. Oh. But also in Boise. So do you have family back there? Or? Yeah. My mom lives in Boise, but I, I live in the building right over there. Oh. <laughs> so you're a student here. What year are you in? A freshman. Fantastic. And why are you here at this event? Um, are you getting extra credit or something? Or something? I saw posters and it seemed really interesting. and. Now, now I'm here. Oh, yeah. As I said before, you're going to get a gift. We live in the north end of Boise. So you know where that's at, don't you? Yeah, our house is 90 years old, and we have great intrinsic connection to it. We can explain that more. <laughs> Go ahead. What did your group come up with? Um, so we talked a lot about how we need to like simplify language, and so that's understandable to the greater population, as everybody else has said. Um, and also how we need to integrate technology and like new um, I, IA and like individual individualism with technology and as our world and technology grows how um, we need to start like focusing on the creativity and the uniqueness of the individual because technology is driven by that and as much as we think that like um, technology and like robots are taking over jobs, those are all driven by the uniqueness and the creativity of the individual. I think that's that. Very good. Yeah. So this is a book that's built on an axiological framework as well. It's 25 leadership skills that break down into thinking skills. Anybody know what dimension that might be? <laughs> Achieving skills. Oh. And relating skills. Yeah, so you can have that book, and I'll sign it for you later if you want. That is so cool to have somebody who just saw the poster and decided. By the way, did you pay your registration fee? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, where, where are we going to go next? Let's go to group five. Clay, I think you were. Everybody next to me, you're 
We have great expectations. You were voted in. She's the most succinct. Um, so uh, we started with a little more of the theoretical side of it with contours transfinite math, which apparently you can look up on YouTube and makes it less scary. I don't know anything about it, but check it out on YouTube. Um, <laughs> and then we decided to go back to the teaching eighth graders, or if we're literally teaching counting in kindergarten, how do we find the way to break it down? So like everyone else said, simple language. Um, and Doug was saying that he plays a game uh, with his, or has always played a game with his kids called What's It Worth, just at the dinner table. And it's simply asking, what do you value more, your brother or your teddy bear? And sometimes that leads to interesting discussions, depending on the day, I'm sure, with how their brother's um, been treating them that day. Um, but then in general, that kind of morphed into a little bit of what Cleo was saying about using technology and kind of trying to gamify it in some way to entice kids these days um, more and make an app, potentially, that is more accessible to the, the broader public. Um, and then also breaking down for adults in the world already, how, how is this practical for them? So um, Leonardo was saying, um, how, do, how do we show lawyers how they can use it? How do we show business leaders? And just making sure that they know exactly how it's practical and why it's important to what they're doing. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yes, good point. Rick is the spokesperson for her point. So I think there is, there's common, a common theme here, which kind of goes back to Cliff's common language from this morning. But we, we talked about simplifying it too. And the discussion really started with, we need to have common questions that we ask. And then the system, and then the different providers are doing things differently. So that kind of led us to that common language. But I think the simplification is when you look back at your list, we started with counting and addition and subtraction. And I would say 80, 90% of the world can do that. There's 10% that can do the stuff at the bottom. When you translate that back up here, we're down here in Algebra 2, trig, Calculus somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we still have never got it back to that simplified where people can understand it. It goes back to what is the, instead of the solution, which most people have a problem, so we go in and consult and solve problems and they give them a, a, a solution, what's the why behind the solution? What is really that piece that's driving the solution and that's kind of back to Cliff's point this morning is how do we give them more information about what's what's happening with the solution and why it works and then that will lead us back into some of these other ones so I think really the common theme that I've seen all all the way through this is just simplifying the language and how do we get axiology to addition and subtraction great thank you so a few closing comments I might be wrong, but the perception I have is that most of our conversation, maybe 80% of our conversation, was about applied axiology. It was about how we get it into the street, which is where we're at. This is what we feel, we feel this is the problem opportunity that we have to solve. But the science of axiology, formal axiology, the truth is I don't think we're going to get there unless we're able to raise a new generation of axiological scientists. Truth of the matter is I don't think most of us, now some of us in this room, will be able to do it. But most of us, our time has passed for that. The reality is if we're really going to change the world, it's going to be changing it through others. And maybe one of the most important things that we can do is to attract others to this conversation about value. And I think we have generations that are coming up that care about value. They don't know about Bob Hartman, but they care about purpose in their work. They care about growth. They care about concept fulfillment. They care about the things that are in axiology, but they don't have a map yet for how to get there. When I think about the awesome task that Cliff gives us, how are we going to change the world, it's really daunting. It can be just feel good without any real practical application. But I'm going to suggest that every significant thing that happens starts small. Galileo didn't know what he was going to create. But Galileo, we would not even know him today had there not been others who came after him who built on it, who took it to higher levels. 
So I'm going to suggest that we start with what can I control 100% about contributing to this changing world. And we got four good steps from Cliff this morning. I think if that video that Cliff that was made of Cliff's presentation this morning becomes available, one thing that we could control 100% is how many people we're going to show it to. Another thing we might be able to control 100% is how much we invest ourselves in continuing to study and learn and reaching out to create this next generation of axiological scientists. I can tell you that one of the things that's working inside of me, I'm, I'm not ready to make a commitment yet because I don't, once I make a commitment, I always follow through. But I have a dream of providing scholarships for axiological scientists because we really need people in the academic world who care about the theoretical more than they care about the practical or will never advance the science. So what can we do in terms of supporting, encouraging, supporting, and endorsing other people who are going to help us create more of the formal science of axiology? The second thing, and it really is it's what we can control, the second thing is where can we collaborate? And I think valuable collaboration is always built on shared interests and shared values. So where do we have shared interests in advancing axiology? I'm thinking about collaborating with Cliff. I mentioned to him after his talk this morning that we have contacts with lots of universities around the world. I'm going to figure out how we can create what we refer to as a virtuous conspiracy to get Cliff into some of those universities to speak. To get him in front of those students. I, I don't care so much about the administration unless the administration opens the doors to the students. And we can begin to show these people that there really is a way that they can be consequential and make a difference in the world around us. The greatest danger that we have is getting so caught up in our concerns about what's happening today that we become despairing. That we become without hope. And there's nothing to be gained there. And it's like punching holes in your bucket. No matter how much you fill it up, it always leaks out. So we have to develop a little bit of a focus with blinders on saying, yeah, we know there's this stuff going out there, but I need to spend my time focusing on the things I can control and the places where I can collaborate. It's really a momentous task. It's a huge mountain. Probably if we knew every obstacle we have to overcome to get there, we would quit now. But the interesting thing about human experience is that we commit to things not really realizing how much we're going to have to change in order to fulfill that vision. So let's go create a beautiful future for formal axiology. Thank you.